Hi, I'm Mark Cusano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Today, we're going to focus on three uh, you know, broad topics. One is going to be oil, looking at supply demand, and then going a little bit deeper into global refined products. The second is going to be looking at uh, some global economic data points. And then we're going to wrap up with the primary vision frac spread count and where we think production is going to go on both natural gas and oil you know, as we go through the end of the year. So let's just really dump, uh, jump right in and, and look at Nigeria. So here, Nigeria talks about, you know, cutting, you know, we're going to make up for cheating. And here they actually take their August numbers up. And uh, they went from about 1.6 to now about 1.719 million. Now understand that based on the deal that they struck, they were supposed to be at about 1.4. And then they are, were submitted something to come up with a, a way to make up for cheating. And, but yet they're now about 300,000 barrels a day over where they should be, which is going to be problematic as we start looking at, okay, well, Saudi Arabia and uh, the GCC in general is increasing uh, production by 1.2 million starting in July. So where, where is this going to come from? Where's this shortage coming from as we have these you know, countries reversing some of their uh, voluntary cuts and Nigeria continuing to produce over what they were supposed to and what their allotment was? So this is something that we're going to have to look at and, and, and see if maybe they were given some kind of leniency because their balance sheets are so bad. You know, maybe there's going to be an adjustment that if things start to turn around, then they'll come back and, uh, and make some cuts. But again, this is something that we're going to have to look at because a lot of this oil ends up in both Europe as well as the U.S., and when we talk about, you know, people who have carried out cuts, you know, we talk about Russia. So Russia has has continued to cut. It, it's, it sounds great and, and it looks great. And there's a lot of reasons why they could adjust uh, in the near term. But the other side of things is they're actually adjusting their refinery throughput a little bit higher. So even though they continue to have low demand domestically, they're taking the, refinery, the refiners up. So this gives them a certain amount of opportunity to increase the exports of refined product, which we've actually seen happen from the Middle East, which we'll talk about in a little in a little bit going into Europe. So this gives a little bit of, of optionality. So they can take some of their euros up, you know, they can take some of their refined products up in terms of the exports. But again, this looks good. This has this this has something that they're meeting what they said that they were going to meet. They're uh, and they're really trying to support pricing, which you know, as we all know, with the uh, Russian economy, they need it. But at the same time, you have to consider who's buying it. And when you look at the uh, the amount of uh, very large and ultra large. Uh, crude carriers signaling China. I mean, we're we're at 137. You know, we're at the highest that we've been at in three and a half some odd years, and you know, could be at, at for, if forever since since we started keeping track. This is the most that we've ever seen signaling. Now, given signaling is one thing. Like you know, some of these can be resold. They can be um, they they can take advantage of the market if things get a little bit uh, more expensive, and they can kind of you know capture that orb. But again, this is something to to consider when you think of. You know how much Saudi Arabian crude has been sold into China. Saudi Arabia still maintains the um, the, the top spot selling into into China. You know uh, Russia has been trying to sell more into India, and there's a lot to be had right here. Like there's a, there's a lot to look at and think about. Where is this crude going, and can it be resold? So when we take this and we drill down a little bit, you can look at the Shandong region, which is where all the ind independent refiners sit. And you can see floating storage continues to increase. You know, we, we showed some charts before about, you know, how Asia is really driving the floating storage, but we really need to focus on China because China is a big piece of that. So when we look at just the port itself, you can see how there's more and more uh, boats appearing and will continue to be a glut because if, if, you know, why are you going to go out and buy new Russian Saudi flow when you have all these boats sitting here, unless there's some opportunity, which is why seeing Russia come down isn't too crazy when you think about China not coming to for the Euro, but then Nigeria starting to increase a little bit. It's like, okay, well, maybe they feel a little bit better about how Europe and the U S is going to be purchasing their crude. When we look at, you know, how 
the floating storage is, is driven by China. You know, we can look at it and separate out, uh, separate out Asia and the rest of the world, just to kind of give you a semblance of an idea of what this looks like and what's really the driver. You know, Asia continues to be the surge. We don't see that stopping over the next, let's call it the next two weeks, especially be, uh, based on the VLCCs and, um, and ultra large that are, that, that are signaling to go to China. Now, they can slow steam, they can take their time, but in the end, they're going to get there or they're going to be resold within the region. So the, the crude is on the water and it's going to find a home. The question is who's home? And that's why we remain uh, cautious on total pricing. And when we shift a little bit further and we look at, okay, well, how is, what is, what's happening in the rest of the world for floating storage? And we've seen some declines, you know, uh, but at the same time, we're seeing increases in the Gulf Coast and in West Africa. So those are the two spots right now that we're focusing on the most because we think you can see some of this decline start to either level off or or start to creep higher as we make the final push through summer driving season. So we think that West Africa could, you know, especially with Nigeria increasing the amount of production that they're having and the Gulf Coast trying to be opportunistic, you know, you could see a little bit of an increase. You know, Europe has seen a decline which should be con- that which should continue just because you have a certain amount of restarting. But you also have a significant amount of new refined product that's being pushed into the market, specifically the European market. And when we think about what's being pushed into the market, we can look at Singapore as kind of like a bellwether. So Singapore, you can see that there's been a slight decline in just total uh, products, but we're still at seasonally all-time highs. You know, light distillate and middle distillate, which is how they uh, classify it, which essentially carries everything from octane all the way down to, to jet fuel, has started to decline a little bit, you know, but again, th- this is something where a lot of Indian distillate has already been moved into Europe. Uh, uh, the Middle East continues to send flow into Europe and China is, is still has these record exports. So we think that this is going to remain, which is going to continue to weigh on pricing. You know, we've already seen crack spreads, you know, reverse negative. Uh, you know, we've seen pressure across the whole uh, complex. And this is also a renewed issue as there remains weight in terms of all of the storage. And when we look at China, we have to look at the exports. You know, our expectation was that May gasoline exports were were going to go down. We were going to see actually a reversal. They were going to backfill. Instead, China made all-time new highs. You know, diesel exports came down, which makes sense if you think about they're trying to move you know, product through, so they're going to consume more diesel locally. But gasoline is the consumer. You know, gasoline, it, the fact that they didn't have the gasoline demand and they're pushing it into the market sh- should should raise a red flag. It's like, okay, well, how strong is the consumer? Are they buying? Are they moving? Are they traveling? Are they working? And those are things that we're continue to get mixed reviews from, especially from China, because, you know, we all know how great their data is. But these are things that we can we can calculate, we can see because they're they're actually hitting the water. And now diesel is something that we think will reverse, especially as these refiners that we talked about on on Wednesday, how they've had a huge resurgence and they're starting to come down a little bit. But again, they're still operating at it at an elevated level, and they have all this crude to work through. And the crude is was bought at about twenty seven dollars, so there's still a little bit of margin. So you could see more uh, product hitting the water, which is going to continue to weigh on global crack spreads. And speaking of global crack spreads, you know, here we have the European imports. And you can see a huge slug of new uh, new Middle East uh, flow going into Europe. And there's been so much that some of it's actually been redirected in terms of, you know, we're going back to different locations. And, you know, France was a big buyer of the, of the U.S., uh, um, distillate, you know, Spain has also been, you know, they've seen their um, their flow double to about seven hundred forty seven thousand tons, and this is going to be problematic because now you have all of this product hitting Europe, you have storage that's about anywhere between the five year average and a little bit higher, but you also have the Rhine River uh, falling, so you have barges that have to carry seventy five percent or less of normal uh, flow just to kind of maintain their distance off the uh, off the ground and and this is going to be problematic i mean this is there's a huge amount of product that's coming into the market so even if they're not taking in oil 
you know, this is going to, to create an issue in terms of, well, they have to get rid of the product, which is why when we talk about oil prices, we try to look at the whole chain because the whole chain is going to impact pricing, not just on the oil side, but also refined products. And it's a good way to manage or really keep our, our pulse on uh, uh, total demand. When we talk about demand, we really have to consider you know, what is the, what are the economic indicators showing us? And, you know, based on our own internal uh, port data, you know, the work that we do in terms of AIS transponders and really focusing on the export import side of the equation, you know, we, you start to get a, a picture that isn't all that rosy. And when we look at the IMF just had a recent uh, global forum, they actually increased the, or I should say decreased the, where they think GDP is going to go. And when you look at June, like the new forecast is for 4.9% uh, decline on a global level with the global contraction estimates as high as 6.2%, depending on you know who you're looking at or who you're talking to or what your weightings are in terms of that basket. But the issue is, look at the past, you know, going back to 1980, you can see that we've never really had a contraction on this level. And when you consider the amount of debt sitting on uh, country balance sheets, corporate balance sheets, this is going to be problematic because the leverage ratios are just so absurd that there's going to be a huge problem in terms of purchases. You know, we've shown that through food inflation, we've shown that through uh, the shortage of US dollars in the market in terms of, you know, how people are financing themselves. Themselves. And this is going to continue to be uh, put pressure on the market. And when you consider where we thought the world was in April and where we are in June, you know, we've had COVID cases continue to rise. We've had more and more uh, disruptions to the supply chain, which is going to inherently hit not just the U.S., but also countries that rely exclusively or to a huge uh, per, um, component of exports. And that's going to be problematic as we go forward when we start con to consider where the pain really is going to sit. And that's why it's an interesting chart when you consider what we're going to look at here when you're taking this by, uh, you know, per capita GDP, because we really want to see what is contracting, you know, who is contracting. And right now, just due to one, the linkage of the global supply chain, the global market in terms of globalization, we have a huge correlation that we haven't had in the past. And one of the good quotes from the, um, from, from the World Bank was, the share will be more than 90% higher than the proportion at the height of the Great Depression of 1930 to 1932. So the linkage between these countries and the economic reliance people are having, especially as the dollar is now the, you know, the reserve currency, there's going to be more pain that's going to be spread out so one of the things that we've talked about in the past is even if the U.S. doesn't feel the the recession to the same level, we can, we're still going to import problems because the, it, this is a global pandemic. This is a global slowdown that of the likes we've never really seen before, which is why we, we try to focus so much on global information and not just so myopic on the U.S. because there is going to be issues that are going to come through U.S. doors not, that may not be you know, readily apparent. And that's why we're always trying to look forward and try to focus on where are things going. And that's why when we look at world trade, you know, world trade is expected to fall about 12%. Now, it's supposed to rise by 2024, you know, by 4%. But again, we really don't know. We've never seen this type of recession on this type of level that we have in the previous. You know, when you look at it a little bit differently, you can say that, okay, well, we had a global contraction of, of you know, a little bit, maybe a percent in 2009. And you can see that there was a huge drop off in, in world trade. Again, we're going to outpace that. And the question is, how quickly do we do we actually get you know, back to normal. And we're, it's going to be problematic. And, and that's why we keep looking at export import numbers, because in 09, you had, a, a, you know, QE hadn't started yet. So you had QE coming in, you had a fiscal stimulus, you had monetary stimulus, you had all of these things that had never been tried before. Now we're facing law of diminishing returns. And it's, it just takes more and more capital, even though balance sheets are the worst they've ever been on a country and corporate level when we consider the amount of debt sitting there. 
So that's why we look at this a little bit differently and with a closer lens, because we really don't think we're going to get the same type of V-shaped recovery or this bounce because there's just so much weight sitting there. And to make a, a pretty chart and to look at you know what the expectations are on GDP, you can see the depth in which the you know all these countries are falling. China's blue, which is we all know a lie, just because uh, you know how can they see expansion even though all of their trade partners are going to see contraction? You could say the G the government is going to buy uh, you know GDP points by investing heavily, which is fine. You know it may be, but it's going to be a huge problem. And one of the biggest uh, rewrites between April and June was really India. So India saw the biggest reversion uh, down with about a 4.5% contraction, and it was initially believed to be 1.9%. Now, those were expectations because people thought COVID might have missed them, which is inherently foolish. But that's why we saw some of this, uh, th this rewrite or this revision lower. It was really driven by India and obviously Latin America. Latin America continues to fall under the brunt of COVID, which is going to continue to impact their local economy, their ability to import, you know, just because there's nobody's buying, and then their exports because you have industries that have been shut down or industries that are operating well below utilization rates. So just based on where we see in, you know, the, I, we just like the chart because it's a very good way of kind of depicting just where that those issues are because China is exporting to a lot of these, you know, deep red countries, which I, you're just not going to see the same type of import levels, which is going to directly impact the way China has their exports, which if we look at last uh, last month, their exports were down 3.3%, which missed estimates. And it's just, we think those negative revisions are going to continue to roll through. And that's why we have to turn back to the India and China, um, you know, battle within uh, uh, Latka. And the reason why it's so important is because now you have China actually building up assets at the same place that this, this little skirmish uh, happened. And I shouldn't say little because, you know, there was a significant loss of life. But it's something to consider as we look at it. And, and the issue now is Chinese, the Chinese defense minister is quoted as saying, China has sovereignty over the Galwan Valley region and the Chinese border troops have been patrolling and on duty in this region for many years. Now, both sides you know, keep people on that, on that border. They continue with the patrols. The fact that they're claiming sovereignty is new. And when the last time they claimed sovereignty was in the South China Sea, and we saw what happened, and we continue to see what happens along the nine dash line. And when they claim this, they're they're always willing to back it up. And this is going to be a flashpoint. You know, they we we continue to see rhetoric on oh, both sides met, both sides. You know, they they're they're speaking positively, but you have to follow the infrastructure, you have to follow the assets, personnel and equipment continue to flood into the region. We have China building up, we have India building up. So even though they're saying nice things, we can see that they're preparing for the worst. And just given, you know, we've talked about the economies, you know, India's had the biggest rewrite, you know, China has had the biggest, uh, you know, biggest reduction or with what we think is gonna be in terms of GDP growth. And people will have told me, oh, well, 2017, they had something similar and they turned around. It's like, well, yes. But 2017 was a very different economy. You know, they were both growing. They were both, you know, coming out of a little slowdown in 2016. It's a different world now. Now we have a significant amount of issues that are going to be impacting, you know, the way they they view the world and how they want to maybe distract their populace or give a kind of a rounding, um, a way to focus and a way to to look away from what's happening in, in internally and look abroad. And as the nationalism grows on both sides, this is going to be a flashpoint that we're going to look at going forward. And now shifting slightly to just a bit more on the demand side, you know, we shift to the US. And we've talked about global. Now let's look at Google mobility data. And here you can look at, you know, what that shift really looks like. And the reason why we like, uh, you know, Google, it's about 87% of market share versus Apple, which is about 13%. So you get, a, a, we think, a, a bit broader picture and across more, uh, you know, demographics in terms of who's using what. And the interesting thing is, which I guess shouldn't be too interesting in terms of outdoors, you can see park mobility has increased because people are looking to go to the park. 
And you know, obviously you have people that want to get home from the park. So you have that, re- that reverse and you've seen normalization or you've seen things like spe- specifically grocery stores, pharmacies get normal or normalized to the baseline. We continue to see contractions in retail, uh, transit, and work. And those are things that we don't think are going to change specifically on the work side as we have work from home orders you know, starting to roll back out based on Texas, Florida, Arizona, and you're having more retail and restaurants starting to shut down again or being told to, that they have to delay for another two weeks and start rolling back some of these phases. So that's why some of this data is going to start you know, turning back towards the negative, which is one of the reasons why we're getting a bit more negative on the, uh, on the U.S. economic front. So just to look at what kind of depth are we talking about. So April was really the peak of shutdowns within the U.S., and this is the Department of Transportation information. And the reason why I, we want to show this is so that you can see who really drives miles driven in the US. And you can see the Northeast is obviously you know strong, but it's not driven like the West, South Gulf, South Atlantic, North Central. So just to focus on the West, South Gulf, and South Atlantic, that's where we see the biggest surge in new cases. That's where we're seeing uh, some more stay-at-home orders, some more closures, which is why when we talked about home base, which is you know information we're going to continue to track, we think you're going to see another dip in terms of miles driven. Now, the reason why we're showing this is because the dip in these locations will impact gasoline demand more, will impact miles driven more because that this is where a a huge chunk of the U.S. lion's share of miles driven is earned, not so much in the Northeast. So even though we have reopenings in New York, New Jersey, it won't have the same type of impact, which will be a net negative for uh, gasoline demand. Now this is a, a pretty chart. You know, it looks like my my five year old you know went nuts with the crayon. But you know, we can really dig in and and understand what we're trying to show here. And and the economic indicators have come down pretty aggressively. And we want to show what it looked like between 28, uh, 2008 and 2011. So the big ones here is the economic uh, indicators have, uh, you know, specifically from Michigan in terms of how people are, are feeling and on the sentiment side, what is the confidence, what is their economic expectations. They've continued to bounce off the lows, but again, we're, we're coming off of a massive base. And we think this is something that's going to start turning lower especially as some of the newer information is is calculated, which is inventories, which continue to uh, to to point towards a negative side, specifically the wholesalers. You know, we're also seeing the uh, New York Fed, which is a leading indicator, which is showing now given it was a bounce, but it's something that it's starting to turn negative as durable goods uh, came in disappointing and we have unemployment continuing to rise. You know, continuing claims fell a little bit, but again, it, it's something that we think is going to is going to rise again as we get a new round of layoffs, which is one of the things that is shown really in the Atlanta uh, Fed data, which is when we're looking at GDP and forecasting. So they they actually dipped a little bit down to about forty six uh, uh, a negative forty six print for Q two. The New York Fed, their estimate is about 19, uh, down 19%, and it was previously 25.9. So again, you have this divergence depending on whose basket you're looking at, how you're really factoring that in. You know, we remain pretty confident that we're going to see about a 26% decline in GDP for Q2. And the problem is too, we're also going to go into Q3 on kind of a weaker footing, especially as COVID uh, has that resurgence in some of these locations, specifically in the South. And that's one of the things that we continue to focus on is consumers. Now, we have a podcast coming out next week with Seema Shaw where we really go in depth on the consumer and the retail side. But this is just something to kind of help you know, build that up because we're looking at households, credit card debt, uh, you know, credit card spending. And you can see here, the, as the unemployment rate continues to rise and you have the stimulus starting to run out, specifically the $1,200 people got, the additional unemployment benefits, this is going to be problematic as people start to really question, do I need to pay that car loan this month or can I wait or can, do I really have to pay that credit card loan or I'll, I'll pay some of it? This is going to be a key factor to watch and a key factor to continue to focus on when we're thinking about how people are spending because, again, the consumer is a huge driver for the U.S. GDP and the consumer is going to continue to struggle, to, to struggle here. 
You know, the one thing that we've constantly been focusing on really from the, uh, January onward has been COVID-19. And one of the big pieces that we're looking at is really the resurgence of uh, some of these cases, specifically in Texas, Arizona, Florida, Alabama. You know, we've talked about how important it is when we're looking at driving data and just to actually make that real, just to give you some, some indication. So according to Gas Buddy, Gasoline demand in Texas on June 24th fell 17.8% below uh, June 17th. So this is one of the first times we had a real shift down week over week because we've talked about how year over year is so important and you know you have to factor in seasonality. But now we're now we're talking a little bit more um, apples to apples. We're looking at things that are happening within June. And these are, these are issues that are going to continue to roll out. And so one of the, uh, I think a good question of the day is going to be, you know, how many more uh, energy companies are going to go bankrupt? You know, we've, we've seen another two filings today. We have rumors of some others. You know, we'll talk about cash flow in a minute. But, you know, how, many, um, how much pain do we continue to see through 2020? And I think that'll be something very interesting. And and just thinking about you know what where did that come from? And we're considering, you know, just how bad Houston is getting, how bad uh, Texas is getting overall in terms of COVID. Is there going to be some risk? And that's one of the things that we look at is well, why are we talking so much about gasoline? And gasoline has really been a driver for crude pricing. So it's one of the things where even though maybe it shouldn't be, it, it just is. Like these are just things that develop. And as uh, you know, crack spreads continue to weaken, and now you're starting to see uh, gas prices starting to move. And by this, we're looking at New York Harbor, uh, RB, uh, you know, uh, RBOB. You're starting to get this this feel that all right, things are starting to weaken a little bit. And you know, we think that this is just kind of what we're going to continue to see, and we'll continue to weigh on how you know oil production continues, which we'll talk about. But before we really talk about that, we have to look at, well, what is the primary vision for Axe Spread Count? What is happening today? And we came in with 70. So the, uh, the, the week over week, we went from 78 to 70. So we lost about uh, eight spreads. Now, it's interesting because the fluctuations are, are, are more normal now. Like this is something where you might think like, oh, is this starting all over again? And we're seeing a lot of these one-offs where you had a spread come on, do a job, and now coming back off. And it's in some of the, the smaller basins. So we look at 17, you know, we're seeing some of these small adjustments where we saw one get added. Now we're back to zero, saw two get added, back down one. So these are some small adjustments. So a lot of the big places that really made the lion's share of the gains from 45 to 78 was Appalachia, was the Haynesville, was uh, Texas. So those are, are still holding some of their gains, which we, we think is kind of normal what we're going to see, even though natural gas probably should start to slow back down. You know, we've seen rig counts really bottom out here. You know, we, we had one small adjustment and we don't see much adjusting over the next week or two, especially as WTI kind of hangs around that 38 level. So th this is something to really consider as we're going forward of, you know, what is going to happen to crude over time as these prices continue to kind of whittle away, especially as the cash burn increases. And, and when we talk about cash burn, just look at the activity year over year. You know, we're coming from 379 back down to 70. You know, what we think going forward is we're going to kind of be within that range. Again, some things get added, manage that decline curve, maybe bring, a, you know, a new well on, do a work over, maybe start seeing a little bit more refracts as people get a bit more comfortable in the uh, the current strip. So we, we think that 65 to, you know, 80 is kind of be that range. You know, we, we should see a little bit of an increase next week. But again, you know, the numbers will be telling, especially as we look at what the cash burn is. You know, this is something that Deloitte put together. We're going to be putting together our own view of cash flow. But this is just one that you're going to see where <laughs> the number is three, 342 billion since 2010. I mean, it, it's just, if this was a tech company, I mean, we would be at all time highs, but you know, this is energy. So that's just not the case. And when you look at where the burn is going to increase, you know, we're only halfway through uh, you know, we're just through June. So we still have a lot of time to go. And this cash burn is going to have to be made up somewhere. Is, is it the high yield market or debt market in general? Is it some sort of maybe secondary or are we going to start seeing some sort of consolidations? There's going to be a lot of issues going forward because in 2012, 2014, we were in a very different world. We were starting to understand fracking. We were starting to understand new basins. We were starting to see 
what opportunities are there. And now we're on going the wrong end, uh, the wrong way in terms of acreage valuations and where things are, are going forward. And that's going to continue to weigh on you know where things sit and how these companies can operate back down to who's at most risk, like how, how many additional companies are going to go bankrupt. And that's something that we're going to address in one of our reports, you know, and something that we're going to continue to look at. And when we talk about, you know, natural gas, probably not seeing the kind of love that it's getting, this is the curve that we're talking about. You know, even though we've had, uh, uh, you know, burns have, have been a little bit underwhelming, given the fact that we've had a, uh, the, the, uh, the weather has started to cooperate a little bit. I mean, we, the weather was, we started out kind of weak, started to ramp up and well, we'll I can show that in a second, but here the, the big focus or the one what we're looking at is how quickly that front month came down. And that's the view of the associated gas coming back, as well as the new activity that we're seeing in some of these uh, gas basins. And you're starting to see the, uh, the curve react to that. So we don't see anything really exciting here. This is something that would actually be a little bit concerning. And one of the things that we're that we're looking at is just those uh, heating day, uh, the cooling days. So cooling degree days, we we're at a, a seasonal all time high. We're not at an all time high. Just you know, typically July is is where we see the most. But you know, the weather has finally started to cooperate. It started out slow through June, and it's expected to accelerate and get. Uh, you know, the demand was going to increase through the first uh, week of July. You know, this going to about July tenth. So it's something to, to consider, and it's when we're thinking about crude production, we have to appreciate what the three streams, you have associated gas, you have oil, and you have NGLs, liquids, condensate. And this is uh, something that we've been looking at, and we've actually have our own estimates in terms of where we think things are going to go. But you know, we're at about 10.7, which I think most of these companies are right around where we are. You know, the question is going to be how quickly do we respond? And we're a bit more bearish and we, you know, probably track much closer to what Enveris and IHS believe in terms of kind of this continued uh, reduction in in uh, in full on production, especially at these levels and given the kind of cash burn that we're talking about. And when you think about, well, how, how do you come up with that? We look at the curve and the curve is, we think, very telling. The front month obviously has has rallied, but you've started to see the shift down in terms of what the expectations are as we go further out. Now, just again, we're halfway through driving season and it's been relatively lackluster given we had that strong rally. Now we're seeing COVID coming back and you're going to start to see that slowdown, which is going to continue to weigh on just drilling and just activity, which is why you know, you're starting to see this this shift into who is is going to get the money, who who is who's going to continue drilling. So OPEC is going to continue to be something to watch, just because how are they reacting? And then it's going to be sales. Like, where is the U.S. selling crude? Is it to our own refiners? You know, China has started to slow down in terms of its purchase, and we think there's going to be renewed headwinds as Florida, Texas, and others, you know, start to face. Uh, you know, and move backwards in their phase rollout, which is just going to hurt total demand. Our lineup for next week on Monday, we have our conversations coming out with uh, Seema Shaw, where we really go through the consumer, the retail sector. How are people spending? How are people going to spend over the next few quarters? We have one of our big reports coming out where we're going to look at everything that we've talked about, but in more depth, especially uh, Russia, India. You know, what side does Russia fall on? Do they support India? You know, I, I can give you my answers, but, you know, it's something that we're going to talk about in more depth. Wednesday, we have our EIA report. And Thursday, because of the uh, 4th of July holiday, we're going to come out with our primary vision for X spread count. So again, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.